Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Welcome to another episode of Top Traders Unplugged. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I know how valuable your time is, so I appreciate you spending some of it here with me. On today's show, I'm talking to Scott Foster, founder and president of Dominion Capital Management. Scott is the first person that I've come across who managed to combine elements from philosophy, psychology, and magic into a disciplined trading strategy which focuses on finding the universal truth in human behavior and apply them successfully in the financial markets. This is truly an educational journey which keeps surprising right to the end. And for those of you who are new to the show, I just want to let you know that you can find all of the show notes, including a full transcript of today's episode on the toptradersonplug.com website. Now let's get started with part one of my conversation. I hope you will enjoy it. Scott, thank you so much for being with us today. It's, uh, it's great to have you here. It's good to talk with you, Niels. Fantastic. Now, the first thing I noticed in preparing for our conversation today is, in fact, that you're celebrating your 20th anniversary as a firm. So let me start by congratulating you on a, on a very big milestone uh, in a business where only few firms can say that they have successfully been navigating the financial markets for, for two decades. Well, thank you. I, I didn't think we'd make it at times. No, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, I know that behavioral finance has become a bit of a buzzword these days and that it draws on philosophical and psychological elements. But my understanding is that these things probably did not come to you as theory, but more as a natural element in your upbringing as a child, since your father, if I'm not mistaken, taught philosophy. And I assume that this is where you got your initial inspiration or curiosity in life to pursue something that in a sense, has become a very important part of your journey and the way you approach trading and life in general. So I'd love to hear much more about this, as it's not a, a common background, I think, of a successful trader and fund manager. And if we didn't just throw the fact that you're also a magician into the mix, I think we have the ingredients of a fascinating conversation. And I guess it goes to show that many different paths and approaches can be used when it comes to navigating the financial markets. But before we get into all of the details about the company today, I would love for you to take us all the way back and really telling us your story and what led you to take this path and, and feel free to go back as, as far as you want uh, as it's really a getting, getting to know what led you down this road in the first place. All right. Uh, well, probably the best place to start is when I was... Um entering college and my interests were actually in computers at the time okay and I entered college as a computer major um, actually double major computer pre-law my mother wanted me to be a lawyer okay I was fascinated by computers and I was uh, uh, around the clock I would be on my uh, radio shack computer uh, on bulletin boards doing some hacking programming that kind of stuff and I kind of fell in love with uh, programming because I'd been taught symbolic logic at a young age from my father, who was a professor not only of philosophy, but of logic. Okay. But after I got into college, uh, I ran into a few problems. They, uh, I found that college administrators don't really 
take too kindly to hacking. <laughs> so I decided it might be better if I switched my major and having the familiarity that I did with uh, philosophy, um, I felt very comfortable with that. I ended up uh, jumping in and studying philosophy and uh, also a lot of psychology. Mm -hmm. I never, in a, never ever would have uh, occurred to me that I'd end up uh, managing money. It was not in, the, uh, not in the cards, at least I didn't think it was. I was uh, planning to um, become a professor like my father and teach. Right. You know, write books and read books and uh, all that kind of fun stuff. But along the way, I got involved with uh, who now is my wife, and she was a few years behind me. Mm -hmm. And so I had to figure out how we were going to coordinate getting married and moving on when there was a, a spread there. So I decided that I would not go on to graduate school immediately. I would stay uh, at the college where we were and work there for two years until she finished her undergraduate degree, and then, and then we would move on. Okay. And during that time period, that would give me a little bit of time also to make a little bit of money to pay for graduate school. Right. And uh, my father, being a, an academic uh, his whole life, uh, he also was quite an entrepreneur and an investor, and he did much, much better in the, in, um, as an investor, uh, both in real estate and in equities. And as an entrepreneur, owning a delicatessen and some other things, he made most of his money outside of the academic <laughs> world. So I, I, it occurred to me that maybe I could do the same thing. I could make some money to help you know, pay for graduate school and get myself started in, uh, with, you know, with a new family and all that type of thing. So I, uh, I had investments. I had been interested in investments. My father had given me some, uh, some money that uh, he had put into uh, Peter Lynch's Magellan Fund way back in the day, and it had right. done well. And sure. gave it to me, and I thought, well, you know what, I can do this uh, investing thing. And so I began to uh, read as much as I could about putting together portfolios and, uh, and different types of investments. And I guess it was around the time uh, it was uh, the crash happened in, in 1987. Yeah. And I was bearish going into it, and, and I was reading, you know, coming, uh, you know, something else that I'm sure we'll talk about at some point was the, the school I went uh, was known for its economics department, even though I was not an economics major. Okay. It was be because it was, it was one of the few schools, uh, there are many now in the country, well, not many, but maybe a dozen or so that teach uh, economics from an Austrian perspective. But uh, Grove City College, where I went, um, had been doing it since the 50s. Mm hmm um, due to the fact that the uh, chairman of the economics department was uh, von Mises' first PhD student in the United States. Right. So anyway, no, the the point being that uh, I was bearish, but I, I to me bearish was the you know what I learned in books about uh, equity investing. You just simply go a little bit more to cash, maybe you know take on some defensive stocks, uh, some utilities, maybe some gold stocks. And I did that. The crash happened, and uh, I lost money. Not as much as probably most people did, but <laughs> I lost money, and I was very disappointed. And then I heard that some of the students of uh, Professor Senholtz, who was the chairman of the economics department, who was teaching a course at the time uh, in futures trading, believe right. it or not. This okay. was in the 80s. Very unusual. Yeah. For, especially considering I was undergrad. Mm. And several of the kids in the class took his advice that the market was in a bubble and that it ought to be shorted, and they bought a bunch of puts <laughs> on okay. uh, the stock market. I think it was... I'm not, I can't remember if it was the S&P 100, but they bought some puts. For, so uh, so you do learn something in school, I guess. Uh, well, they did. <laughs> and uh, I, I learned uh, that they made money and I didn't. Um, right. I think they each made uh, about 50000 apiece, which the, wow. you know, for a young college student back in the uh, 80s, that was a staggering sum. Mm. And it completely just blew me away because I was entirely unaware that there yeah. were these derivatives, that there were options and futures, and there, was, there were different ways to express opinions other than just simply you know, buying and holding a stock. Mm -hmm. Literally, the day after I heard that, which was a day or two after the crash, I started trying to find any information I could on futures trading and options, okay. and uh, taking you know, kind of the same academic approach that I was brought up to, <laughs> to go through that process. You just you read and study and research everything you possibly can. Well, there, wasn't, there weren't a lot of... Uh, books available back in the 80s. No. You know, there were maybe a dozen or so that I could find, and I bought every one that I could find and began to read and, and try to, to figure out how I could, uh, how I could make money like that. Mm. And I, it was a, a, just an incredible fascination for me because it, was, it became uh, you know, kind of a, a quest. But was, when you realize how many different uh, ways you can express yourself in the markets, you know, vis-a-vis -vis futures or, or, or options, you can you know, emulate being a farmer, you can emulate being in the oil industry, you can, uh, you know, act as if you're a bank, you can uh, do international thing. I mean, it was just a, it, it was like uh, taking a, you know, the, the 
a blanket off and letting the, the sun shine. It was just sure. so unbelievably fascinating to me. Sure. So after about six months of reading all this stuff and try, and thinking, you know, uh, I can come up with some strategies. I, I think I can make some money here. I realized that I didn't really have very much money <laughs> to trade. So and you kind of needed some money to trade some money. So I thought, what am I going to do? Well, I, I'd recently finished school and I didn't have any money. Uh, I just had some of the money that was left over from my investments. And so I took that money and then I went uh, to my friends and said, you guys saw what uh, happened with these other guys on campus and they made a lot of money. How about we pull some of our money together and I'll trade it for us. And they said, well, we do, you know, we're all paying for our college. We don't have any money either. Well, you know, I said, well, what, you know, <laughs> you have credit cards, right? Everybody got a credit card while they were in school. Take a cash advance off your credit card. Well, at 29.9%, um, yeah. six or seven of us all took the maximum amounts we could off all the credit cards that we had accumulated while in college. And we were able to pool together about $20,000, Okay, which uh, seemed like a staggering sum. And now knowing what I know about how compound interest can work against you, 29.9% on <laughs> money that you're speculating with is probably not necessarily the best way to go. No. Uh, but it didn't stop us. Uh, we opened an account and uh, I started trading and applying a wide variety of strategies, stuff that I'd read, just anything I'd read, I, I would try. Okay. And so I was day trading. I was trading some spreads relative to, you know, some crazy different spreads and, and uh, currencies. And, you know, the first week I made $10,000. I thought, wow. wow, this is great. The second week I made another 10000 oh. The third week I made another 10000 The fourth week I made about 15000 And uh, I'm already thinking, you know, I'm about six months away from retirement here. Yeah, this is, exactly. This is, this is awesome, you know. And uh, everything was just going well. And I remember I got a meeting of the guys. We all got together, and I said, "Look, here, we'll you know we're going to start upping the leverage once we get you know to about two hundred thousand, and you know already targeting you know when, when we're going to get to the million dollar level." And <laughs> everybody's eyes are wide, and we're just you know you just can't even imagine uh, how pumped up we were. Sure. Well, then over the next few days, I got involved in uh, the coffee market. Right. And there's uh, you know I, I learned later there's a very good trading maxim that says, you know, you should never trade anything that you can eat for breakfast. Right. And that means you probably ought to avoid coffee, cocoa, uh, pork bellies, uh, eggs. Well, I guess pork bellies and eggs aren't around anymore, but uh, cocoa. I mean, it, these markets are very, very difficult and erratic and they, they're very uh, closed and very specific and they can be traded, but they're, they often surprise uh, novice traders on how they, uh, how they trade. Sure. So the market was rallying, and, and, and I'm reading any news stories that I can get, and I'm trying to figure out, uh, you know, I've been tracking a lot of commodities for almost a year, trying to understand their nature and their historic price ranges and all this, and, and coffee had a spike up, and I thought the coffee fundamentals that I've been reading for the last six months were bearish, and this was, uh, the spike was on a, uh, a rumor that there was going to be a, a Brazilian dock worker strike. Right. But everything I could tell from what I had read was that it was illegal for them to strike. The government actually has to give them permission to strike or something along those lines. And they had said that they would not do that. Okay. So uh, I decided to go short the coffee market. And uh, I can't remember how many contracts I went, but I know it was the most that I could do with the margin I had available. Okay. Which uh, was another money management lesson uh, <laughs> I was to learn was not good. I think I was, uh, I also, I think I did some cocoa too that rallied in sympathy, um, but mostly it was coffee. I was sure a, a bunch of coffee sure. and the market just was going, you know, up a little bit, down a little bit, up a little bit, down a little bit. And back, this was, you know, you have to remember, this was back uh, 1988, a right. uh, long time ago. So it, uh, you know, there's no internet, there, it, very few people have quotes. Um, I, I think I was trading through Jack Carl at the time and they had this phone, um, you could dial in with a touch tone phone. Okay. And if you if you if you typed in like a couple of symbols, it was the commodity code, and then the you know the month of the contract, uh, like a, a synthesized computerized voice would you know rattle off the open high low close oh, of where the market was. Yeah. So you know my method of watching my positions was about every ten minutes I would call and then I would I would chart it on paper okay. where everything was going. So, sure. Well, I'm charting the coffee trade that I'm in and. All of a sudden, the market starts to accelerate against me, and, and down, you know, five thousand dollars, and then down, you know, seven thousand dollars, and the market is um, closing. 
Now, right. one of the things about the touch tone, you know, quote setup was that it had a, a staggering lag to the real market. Sure. So the market's actually, you know, it's the time is it's closed theoretically, but I keep calling and and the price keeps going up higher and higher. And I'm like, how can it be going up higher? The market's closed. <laughs> sure. uh, not realizing how much of a lag I'd been trading with all along and didn't even realize it. And it kept going against me further and further. I think by the time they gave the official settlement, I was down twenty-five thousand uh, dollars sure. on this position, and wow. uh, just absolutely devastated. I mean, just in shock. Yeah. And my heart rate was going through the roof. Uh, I, I, and so I was scrambling. It was so difficult to get information back then, and trying to, you know, call up the brokerage and say, you know, what are the news stories? What's going on, and so forth. And mm. I was finally able to dig up a few news stories later in the day that were talking about. What had happened was that apparently the, the, the government gave the Brazilian dock workers a, a right to strike. Okay. And so they were, they were projecting, you know, coffee was going to go so much higher in London. And I did the conversion and, and tried to figure out where that price was that they were projecting. And I turned like, you know, six shades of green <laughs> um, because it's not only going to, you know, cost me more money. It's going to wipe out the entire rest of the trading account and go deficit. Right. So, you know, literally in a span of, uh, you know, 48 hours, I'm on the top of the world thinking I'm, you know, I'm the next uh, Paul Tudor Jones. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I am, you know, the answer to trading. Yeah. Uh, and then I'm, I'm practically can't breathe. And I'm thinking these guys, my friends are going to kill me. I'm going to have to go to family members to bail me out. I'm, I, you know, I owe all this money. Why didn't we pay some of the money back to the credit card company after we you know, doubled the profits? And uh, you know, questioning everything. And sure. uh, up to that day, I don't think I had ever had a sleepless night in my life. Right. Uh, you know, when I was in college, I never pulled all nighters to study. It just, I wasn't that engaged to do that. I mean, it was uh, being a philosophy major, when you grow up in that world, you kind of, uh, you know the material. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So you don't have to worry too much about that. But I had a sleepless night. I literally stared at the ceiling and, and listened to my heart just mm. race and thinking, what am I going to do? I have just destroyed my entire life. Uh, I'll, I'm never going to recover from this. Yeah. Well, the next day uh, I get ready for the uh, the coffee open, and fortunately, it doesn't uh, open in the U.S. as high as it had opened in London. It had already kind of opened and sold off a bit in London, but it was still a, a nasty gap higher, and it ended up wiping out everything in the account except for about ten thousand dollars. So we had. I think we'd run the account up. I'd run the account to I don't know somewhere sixty, sixty-five thousand, something like that, and so it wiped out everything except for ten. So uh, I had to then get on the phone and call the other guys who so graciously advanced money off their credit cards to me, in uh, you know waiting for the the, the the checks to come in the mail. I thought they were going to kill me. These were you know good friends of mine. And, sure, uh, they. They were okay about it. They said, "Look, you know, you still have there's still ten thousand dollars in the account. I mean, you took twenty thousand and you ran it up. Well, just take that money and run it up." Okay. And uh, I thought, "Hey, yeah, I can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I just won't trade coffee anymore." <laughs> um, so, so I did. I, after a couple of days, to get my head together. Uh, I went back to the drawing board and began to look at. Uh, the trades I had been analyzing, and, uh, and and a lot of the trades that I was doing at the time, aside from outrights, I was doing a lot of spread relationships. It just they made sense to me. I could understand more relative value than I could absolute. They, that seemed to be a lot more uh, predictable. Whether you know whether you're trading hogs against cattle, or you know feed against the cattle, or or you know cotton against soybeans. Where back in the day they actually competed for planting, which they really don't anymore. But sure. you know and currencies against each other, and, and all that type of stuff. Crack spreads. Um, and so I found a, a, a spread that was at a historical extreme in wheat. It was a May-December wheat spread. And so I worked my way into that position. And uh, it ended up being correct. And uh, I tripled the account size. And you know, I knew from that point on I was never going to make it to graduate school. <laughs> uh, I was hooked. I mean, this sure. was the greatest thing since sliced bread. I mean, yeah. uh, unfortunately, uh, I could pick some decent trades, but I knew nothing about money management. As right. As obviously, you can tell from the coffee trade. So I, I, I managed to, uh, you know, put myself in, in multiple difficult situations. I think the, the next, maybe it was the next month after that, after I recovered and then built the account up some more, I, I, I found another spread that, that I thought, and, and I wasn't just doing the spreads. I was kind of trading around stuff at all, you know, buying a few currencies here and there and just day trading in and out and doing a lot of things. And then I'd build these big positions and spreads when I really got a conviction sure. because I, I really felt that 
you know, they were going to revert back or they were going to go. I got involved in a, in a copper spread, a May-December copper spread that um, was a, as a ex- huge extreme. The front month was trading, I think it was around 14, 15 cents over the, over the December, which right. at that point was, uh, it was out there. I, mean, yeah. I think the all-time historical extreme at that point maybe was 17 or 18 or something like that. Okay. So I was trying to build a position, expecting it to go to Contango, to have this thing go all the way back to you know where the uh, you know the December would have been premium to the May, sure. and so I was building a position, and then it went maybe six or seven cents in my direction. I thought, oh, this is great. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna pyramid this. Mm. So I put some more on, and then it started to go against me. Yeah. Which then I was losing money at double the speed because of my brilliance of increasing the position size. <laughs> Well, it went. It started to go against me, and it just kept going against me, like day after day. Mm-hmm. And it was unbelievably, you know, I get that same feeling back—the coffee feeling, even though it wasn't coffee. Yeah, uh, I was sick to my stomach. It just every day was like pain. It would go against me another 25, 30 points. I'm thinking this can't go any further. And then it stabilized for a few days, and I made another brilliant move. I decided to increase the position because then it would take me less to get back. Uh, to at least break even. So yeah. I uh, added a few more onto it. Mm-hmm. And then literally the next day, the spread had a, an outrageous 200-point move against me, followed by more. I think the, I think ultimately the spread peaked at about $0.20 cents premium the, the May over the December, yeah. which was, uh, I think, at all-time extreme. Uh, I, I don't know since then, but sure. at that point, I think it was all-time extreme. Um, and I couldn't take the pain. And yeah. literally, I dumped uh, half of the position, which we had, well, was quite large at the time. Yeah. I dumped half the position. And then the very next day, it started moving in my direction. Mm-hmm. And after, I don't know what it was, three or four days, I got back half of all the money that I was down, which was quite a bit. I just couldn't take the pain anymore. Sure. I, no, exactly. I bailed out of the position. Yeah. And then sat and watched it go in my direction, I think it was like the next 17 days in a row. Wow. And it literally went to Contango. The okay. May went, uh, the December went premium. I don't know if it was full, but it went premium to the May. And I, I would have made it just a staggering amount of money. Mm. Uh, but instead, I was just completely ruined and, and devastated emotionally. I hadn't uh, lost as much money as uh, the coffee trade. Sure. It was a setback, but it was just, I, I never realized that, you know, how badly you could feel, sure. You know, by combining not only taking the loss, but then watching it go in the direction and knowing if you hadn't, you know, later realizing when you do the post mortem that <laughs> um, your main problem is leverage. You don't understand what you're dealing with, which I didn't at the time. I didn't yeah. realize. So I, uh, you know, kept trading spreads, and uh, you know, sure enough, maybe uh, two or three months later, I find a really great soybean meal spread. It's a historical extreme. <laughs> What I didn't realize, there was a reason why it was at a historical ex- extreme. Uh, because some shenanigans were going on in the soybean market. Right. But it, the soybean market was being cornered by an mm-hmm. Italian firm. And I got into the position and it got knocked way out of whack due to the squeeze. Mm. And then I got blown up out of the position. And then the Board of Trade forced them to liquidate their position. And again, I would have made a fortune, but mm-hmm. I couldn't stay with the position. Yeah. And that was kind of really the turning point for me. Why am I living my life this way? I'm, a, I'm in agony and pain half the time, and on the other <laughs> half of the time, I'm in absolute euphoria. Sure. Uh, and after that, that trade, I realized there's got to be a better way to do this. Yeah. Um, I, ca- I can't do this anymore. I've got to find a way that I can manage, uh, you know, I can sleep at night um, and so forth. Were there anyone at the time, Scott, that pointed you in the right direction or were this all self-taught uh in it because one thing is to come to a realization saying this is not a great way of doing it but the other thing is to actually say well this is the way i have to pursue it and sometimes it often helps if someone with experience comes along and 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 point you in the right direction was there anyone around uh you at the time or was it really just uh, your own curiosity that led you uh, to take the next step there was, um, it would have been nice, I guess, maybe yeah. if there had been somebody around. Um, but there were, you know, I guess there were benefits to both ways. I don't think I actually met another trader or, or spoke to one or met one until, you know, maybe three years later. Okay. So it was, and a lot, you know, there was very little written about money management and very little written about just, you know, survival. I mean, it was, uh, the, you, you learned as you went along. Sure. Um, but. So I, you know, I sat down and just and said, I, I, 
you know, I consider myself a smart guy. I can figure this out. I can figure out that I should not over leverage. But, you know, it's the beginning stages where you're realizing how you're, you know, internally you're battling the, the fear greed issue. Mm. You know, mm. you just want to make that money. And then uh, you don't realize, um, you know, as I'm sure we'll get into later when we talk about prospect there, you don't sure. realize the pain side yeah. of it and how much more you're going to feel that pain than the euphoria. Um, mm. So I, I morphed into uh, um, when I when I had that happen that that trade I finally realized I needed to 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 you know broaden my understanding of money management and also my my trading strategies mm. that I, I had been slowly getting away from any kind of diversification both uh, particularly strategically I kept going more to these bigger um, kind of uh, macro spread extreme trades yeah. Um, because the payoffs I had had a lot of success with them, and even the ones that that I blew up on, I could justify to myself. Well, you, I was right. Mm. You know, I picked the right direction, and it was an epic move. And I, and it was just that I needed to do the better money management. But after the soybean soybean meal situation, uh, I, I said I had, and I thought to myself, I've got to figure out some. Uh, I had to be a little more diversified. I've got to get the money management. And at, at that point, it became obvious to me that um, I needed more capital. Sure. And I guess also at this stage, Scott, I mean, you were completely discretionary, right? There was no no rules as such. Exactly, completely. Yeah. Um, and so I kind of at the same time, it's, um, it's ironic that you bring that up because I had had uh, such a fascination with computers and, and, and knew how to program in a variety of languages from years and years and years prior to that. Um, I saw a few advertisements at that time for mechanical trading systems. Oh, okay. So I uh, picked up one of those that had different optimizable things and started to tinker around with that at the same time I was trying to you know, broaden my horizons of looking at different ways of trading and, and trying to understand money management better. And, and also at the same time I realized to do all this, I was going to need more capital. Right. So uh, I, I talked to the guys who uh, you know, were still on the hook for the... <laughs> <laughs> the money for the credit card, and yeah, exactly. And said, you know what, we need some more capital. Um, this isn't enough, and it's dangerous because if I try to diversify strategically and and, and in markets and so forth, um, it may ultimately lower the risk. But we don't have enough capital to diversify correctly, at least mm -hmm. as I saw it at the time. So I said, how about this? How about we form um, um, a company? We that way we can have some shares to issue of this to and do each of us can do the friends family and high net worth that we know type mm -hmm. thing and we can try to get some more capital together sure so i formed uh, we formed this company called uh, the dominion financial group ltd okay and which year are we in now let's go we're in uh 80 it's probably uh 89 okay sometime during 89 we formed the, the corporation i believe and we're able to get some more money through that kind of friends and family thing, which is, you know, another one of those things I look back and think, boy, that was not a smart idea. <laughs> uh, the last thing you want to do is be to be beholden to every person you know sure. for something that may not go as well as they hoped it, you know, or, mm. you know, I didn't know the uh, know your customer rules back then, you know, <laughs> that type of thing. They're, you know, friends and family, sure. they, they should support you to the bitter end. But um, so we raised some money. And again, I was doing all the trading and we, um, um, started to diversify into things and become more strategic and things started coming together and I think as uh, we start, uh, started to make money consistently month after month after month after month and I think we had a you know made instead of making a hundred percent in in weeks you know it took me uh, you know like a whole year to make a hundred percent but it was being done much more consistently and and so forth well kind of in that mix you, you know I, I kind of got lost in the whole situation because I was enjoying myself so immensely doing this that I didn't, you know, it didn't quite occur to me that uh, my personal life was moving on. Um, I got married, I, I was, my wife was finished, and uh, uh, we were having a child. Right. And I'm thinking, you know what, this is, you know, we're only trading a few hundred grand, and the profits that we're making are just enough to uh, cover, you know, quote machines and fax machines and, and and all the stuff that we had were accumulating, and, and the office space that had rented, and uh, you know, it's very difficult to uh, uh, to run a business on such even even that, you know, was still woefully inadequate capital base to run a, a trading operation. But I, you know, I didn't know that at the time. I, you know, um, well, I, I began to know it once the um, <laughs> once I started to think about, you know, I, I can't really uh, I can't hire people on this, and I can't pay myself more on this, and I can't afford 
uh, buying a house on this uh, sure. because we're paying, you know, we still have debt to pay back because we, um, I wasn't smart enough to pay that off when I should have, so sure. we kept ex expanding. Well, I talked, you know, looking for capital is always a tricky thing. You know, I'm, I'm you know, 22, 23 years old, uh, you know, philosophy, psychology, studied, you know, theology, studied, you know, nothing that has anything to do with anything. And I know none of the mainstream firms, nobody's going to set me up or help me out or do anything. So I, I started asking people that I knew, um, you know, do you know anybody who's involved in finance or business? And, and you know, when I was living in, this was in Western Pennsylvania, right? Still in, in Grove City where the, the, the small private liberal arts college was. And, and it's about 60 miles north of Pittsburgh. And so okay. I thought, I'm going to have to go down to Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh's got to have some wealthy businessmen, some entrepreneurs, somebody who can maybe help me because mm -hmm. I have no idea how to, to get to the next level. So I, uh, through a friend of a friend, one of those weird, you know, connections. Somebody sure. knew somebody who happened to have a brother or a friend that went to the same school that I did, and you know, and and I was trying. I didn't even know what to ask for. I, I'm, I was, you know, somebody that's a traitor. Somebody that, that, and so eventually, somebody happened to know a fella who was in uh, in municipal finance in Pittsburgh who knew a guy who worked at a brokerage firm who happened to have been one of the few people that handled some futures trading for traders at Pittsburgh National Bank. Right, okay. And so he, through the series of calls, I was given a name of a guy who used to trade bond futures uh, for Pittsburgh National Bank. But now he was living in uh, a little small Amish community about 15 miles west of where I, I was uh, in western Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So. I called this guy. I have no idea who he is, and, and I, I said I was given your name by this person, and uh, you know I'm, I'm a trader, and I'm just starting to dabble in this kind of thing. I'm looking for some direction on how to get some more capital and so forth. And he says, uh, "Well, you know, why don't you just come over to my place, and we'll talk." Mm -hmm. So he gave me his address, and, and uh, I got in the car, and I I'm driving, it and I, I'm all you know. Grove City is always is in a very rural area to begin mm -hmm. with. Sure. But you go, you know, ten miles west of that, you're in Amish country, and it's there's just nothing. I mean, right. there's horse and buggies and farms, and it's, and I'm thinking I, I must have the address wrong. <laughs> this, this can't be right. And I'm weaving through, and finally, I, I, I I'm, you know, there's no GPS back, and I've got the maps out of the car, and I'm, you know, lost. And I finally get to where the address is, and, and it's just there's like a, a, a farmhouse, and a, beside it, there's this big barn, and I'm thinking this has got to be wrong. <laughs> Uh, and I'm standing out there, and suddenly a gentleman appears out the front door, and, and, and he says, you must be Scott. And I'm, I said, yeah. So I, I guess I'm in the right place. He said, yeah, come on. Uh, let's go talk. I'll show you my operation. And I'm thinking, operation? What, you know, what, your combine? And uh, so he walks me over to the, side, to the side of his house and where this big barn is. It's a really old, you know, it's kind of beaten down. And... He slides open the door, and I walk in there, and my, my jaw just dropped to the floor. There were computer screens everywhere. There were like five traders in there. Lights are going on, people on the phone screaming, and I was just like, this is unbelievable. Yeah. This, is, this is existing in the middle of nowhere in a, in a, on a farm. <laughs> Well, after we got to, to talk a little bit further, I, I, you know, I didn't know a lot of names or people, but he was trading at Pittsburgh National Bank, and he was, you know, good friends with Stanley Druckenmiller, who was there at the same time mm -hmm. uh, in the early '80s. Um, sure. He had made, you know, quite a bit of money being an early Fed watcher and, and and understanding the whole, you know, Volcker thing and the interest rates situation. And he just walked away and decided he was going to trade his own money. And then some of the other trader friends that he had who uh, were, you know, kind of native to that area of western Pennsylvania and mm. said, hey, you know, come in. You want to trade? You can trade out of my barn with me and we'll just, you know, help defer our costs. Well, you know, we can get more the news services and the quotes and stuff and everybody's just on their own. But, you know, there'll be some camaraderie and, and we'll trade. Sure. So I, uh, I sat down with him and I, and I said, here's what I'm doing and here's what I'm trying to do. And, and here's my kind of track record and here's my story. And he looked at me and he said, uh, well, what are, you, what are you trying to accomplish? I said, well, I, I want to get more money so that I can do some more different strategies and so forth. And uh, I said, I want to do what you're doing. I mean, I, I, have, I have my own little setup and I'm in the middle of nowhere, kind of not as much as you're in the middle of nowhere. But, and uh, he looked at me and he said, you know, you're, you'd be more than welcome to come here and trade out of my place and, you know, 
maybe you could get some money. But he said, you know what you really need? He said, you need to go out in the world and see how other people do things and, and really get an education about trading uh, and the different markets and so forth. You know, you've got it all in your head from reading a handful of books, but you'll learn a lot from uh, getting some experience. And he said, and there's this, uh, you know, there are, there, are these, there are companies that trade futures for other people. And uh, he couldn't think of the name of it, and which he was referring to CTAs. Right. And he said that there was a recent article in the Wall Street Journal about a company in Pittsburgh. And he said, I actually uh, am good friends with one of the principals of the company. Why don't I give, why don't I give him a call? And, you know, maybe you could uh, do some stuff with them, or I mean, maybe there's, there's something there, some kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. So he picks up, he puts on the speakerphone, and he, he calls AO Management Corporation. Now, AO Management was, uh, you know, they're no longer around, but they were one of, uh, you know, the really early firms in the CTA world. Yeah, that name um, rings a bell. Al Orr III founded the company. <laughs> he, um, he was an accountant by trade, but he got fascinated with the markets in the late 60s and started thinking that he could develop a trading system, and he started doing it on the punch cards, and, and you know, way back. Yeah. He implemented his system for himself in uh, the early 70s and managed to catch the huge big grain move, you know, the 72 to sure. 74, you know, monster up move. And he made enough money that he quit his job being an accountant and he just wanted to manage money in the futures market, and, uh -huh. um, which he then had a, opened up a fund. And he had a, a, a you know, a, a fund from 1974 on. So it goes back to quite a while. I think it was only Milburn. Yeah, uh, Dunn. And, Dunn, yeah. Dunn was around yeah, at Dunn, the time. Milburn, the Campbell and Company was around. Yeah, sure, uh, sure. There were, there were a few that, that, you know, kind of are still here, but uh, way back. So yeah. this gentleman calls down there and a and, and, um, guy by the name of Carl Peters, who was a, a, the marketing arm at the time for AO Management, who that was his buddy that he knew from uh, when he was, Carl had been the chair of, a, the, I think, the economics department at Westminster College, which was in western Pennsylvania, not too far from him. So... Uh, he pick up the phone and he introduced, he has it on speakerphone and says, Carl, you know, what's going on? Carl says, hey, business is great, you know, we're raising money. At, at that point, literally, and this is, uh, geez, very, very early 1991. Okay. The, the managed futures industry was just eclipsing $10 billion in the yeah. entire industry. Yeah. So it was, uh, I mean, it was very early on. Uh, and, that, and that was after two monster years of growth. Mm -hmm. I mean, it had been almost non-existent prior to that. He said, Carl, what's going to say? Our business is good and all this. And he said, I'd like to introduce you to this fellow named Scott Foster. He's a young trader. He's got, you know, a lot of interesting ideas and, um, you know, he kind of does a variety of things. And Carl said, well, oh, you know, nice to meet you. And, uh, you know, I asked him a few questions about what they did and, and so forth. And then uh, um, the fellow who introduced me to Carl said, but, you know, are you guys looking to hire? Are you looking to team up or partner or do you do any sub allocations or you know just trying to open any possible door for anything to help me out mm -hmm. and Carl said no you know we're not really not you know but you know we've been growing so fast there's always a chance that maybe we might want to hire somebody somewhere down the line why don't you just you know Scott send a resume down here and uh, we'll, we'll take a look at it and mm -hmm. hung up the phone and I said well I, I, you know I'm really not interested in working for anybody I have my own thing and I really like what I'm doing and he said well you know maybe you can do both or you can find a way to to still do your own trading and so forth. So I the next day I sent the resume down to uh, to AO management and uh, they got it the next day in the mail. So miraculously the mail never goes the next day. <laughs> they gave me a call and said, Hey, can you come down and uh, see us? And I said, Yeah, when would you like me to come down? They said, Well come down right away. <laughs> so I drove down to Pittsburgh and chatted with them and spent some time with Al, who was a very interesting guy. Um, and what I didn't know at the time is that uh, Al, um, you know, I was a member of Mensa, mm -hmm. and he had a he had this theory about the way to build a company was to make sure that everybody in the company was a member of Mensa, right? And he was only starting to kind of get up over that because Carl wasn't in Mensa, um, and but but the secretary, all the traders, the receptionists, I mean, everybody that was there had, were Mensa people. Um, <laughs> so it was a very uh, let's just say interesting environment. Right. Um, I wasn't in Mensa, um, um, but we, no, we, we hit it off. So we had a long conversation and he's, and Al said, Hey, you know, I really, uh, I think, you know, I like what you're doing. This is all very fascinating. Um, maybe we can work something out and you can, uh, 
you can do some research for us and you can still run, you know, uh, Dominion Financial Group LTD. Okay. So I thought, hey, that's a perfect world. I'm going to get paid here and I'm going to get introduced and this is like an amazing miracle that I'm that, that going to have some options here. Mm -hmm. So uh, he said, we'll discuss things and why don't you come back down to Pittsburgh tomorrow? Uh, and this whole thing is, this is a whirlwind. This happened like in four days. Mm. <laughs> uh, they call me back down and uh, we spend the entire day talking and they made me a, a, an offer on the spot, which was very generous uh, for the day. Mm -hmm. And uh, they said, you can keep doing what you're doing. So I thought, wow, this is great. This will take a lot of pressure off the small capital base we have. And geez, now I might, now I get insurance for my sure. child. And, sure. you know, this is wonderful. So, yeah. uh, we did that. I uh, packed up everything and moved to uh, all the other guys that were still involved in the Dominion Financial Group. You know, they had graduated and they had all been taking jobs all over the place. So I was really the only person. Uh, I had a little bit of help from a few other guys, but um, the larger group of people were, you know, diverse. So when I told them the Pittsburgh thing, I thought that was good because then we wouldn't have to cover the cost of the office and all the other expenses. So packed up the uh, family truckster and we uh, headed down to Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And after um, a month or two. Al came into my office one day and he said, you know, I'm really, I, I, he really got me thinking about a lot of stuff because within the first few months I had them, they were doing like a single system and I said, you really ought to, you know, you ought to do three systems and do different time frames." And I was introducing a lot of different ideas that just hadn't occurred to him. He was really the only guy doing the research. Right. And uh, after so many years, he wasn't, you know, thinking really of new things. And research was a very difficult thing at AOM. They had a VAX computer. <laughs> You know, there's a mainframe. He, yeah. he bought a used VAX computer for $66,000. Oh. And, you know, he had, everybody had terminals. And um, while I was there over the next few years, people started to get PCs. But it was, uh, <laughs> it was difficult sure. to, do, to do the research. So yeah. uh, he said, you know, I, I want you to be, um, I want you to play a greater part in the company. I want you to be a principal of the firm. And, uh, well, you know, want to give you some more cash and make it more interesting for you. And I want you to stay around. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, if I'm a principal, does that mean I have to stop the Dominion Financial Group? And he said, I'm afraid it does mm -hmm. because, you know, you can't have, you know, conflict of interest. Sure, sure. So I went back to the guys and I told them that and they said, uh, you know, you, gotta, you just got to go for this. This is uh, your opportunity. And, um, so I did. I became a principal of the firm and uh, was, you know, I became, well, I think my title was senior trader. Mm -hmm. um, and in a very short time, I was, you know, there was Al and then Carl, who was buying into a partnership with Al. And then I was the number three guy on the, on the totem pole. So it was um, a whirlwind. I went from, you know, studying philosophy and, and <laughs> literally uh, 36 months later I'm the number three person in one of the 10 largest CTAs in the world yeah um, you know just uh, I don't know if that stuff happens anymore but um, it, it was uh, just it was it was a, it was miraculous sure and it was really a, a great uh, time period but then as everything you know as you learn very quickly in the mm. trading world everything, everything changes yeah and I think the very next year Al's mother died Al's brother died and I was going through, I can't remember if it was number two or number three divorce. Mm. But he just said, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. I've been doing this for, you know, 20 something years. And um, he had, you know, stockpiled enough dough. I wasn't, so he, uh, he made a, a deal with his partner, uh, Carl, to sell Carl the rest of the business. And then the understanding was that then I would, I would get the same deal that Carl had to buy into AO mm. and become a 50% a, a partner. Mm. Well, Carl, uh, having taught out at, I think it was University of Colorado or one of those schools, he had a, a, an office out there that he was doing, he would live out there some of the times and do a lot of marketing. He wasn't really hands-on in the office. He was just flying around the world playing golf and raising money and writing articles. Because mm -hmm. I think he had a PhD in decision sciences from MIT or something. So you know, he had the credibility. But Carl wanted to then move the company out to Colorado. Mm -hmm. So uh, I thought, okay. Um, and he said, I want you to move out. And... All I'm asking is that you, uh, you know, you look down the road and see how great this is going to be. Um, so, you know, financially, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, dangle huge dollars to get you to make this move, but you, you, see, you can see what's going to happen here. Well, I get out to, to Colorado and things get dicey. We go into the, I don't know if you remember, I think it was the 92, uh, 3 early 
94 drawdown. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And, 94 uh, was a difficult year for sure. Yeah, it, was, it went on and uh, um, I think even, I think Campbell and company lost half of their assets during that time period. I remember yeah. guys coming out to the Colorado office and talking and everybody was really, I mean, it was just a very, one of those drawdowns that it's just, uh, didn't, it didn't seem like it was ever going to end. Sure. And that was very uh, destabilizing for Carl and um, I wanted to do other things and, and we weren't seeing eye to eye on the direction of the business and um, I was already developing some shorter term ideas and concepts and we had this, you know, very a lot of the money was this old wirehouse money. It was hundred dollars a round turn. I mean, you yeah. couldn't int- you couldn't introduce short term trading into it to save your life because it just it wasn't feasible. So sure. I didn't have an outlet for that, and I decided, to, you know, I'm I'm just going to go do my own thing. Mm. Yeah, I, I was missing what I had done before on my own, and now I had gotten some more experience and I'd seen. I was looking at the growth of this managed futures uh, industry, and it just was like, there, this is an opportunity of a lifetime. Mm. Um, so I packed up uh, and moved to Chicago. And I, got, I found somebody to, to back me, uh, the, uh, um, John O'Brien, who was uh, at the time the president sure. of R.J. O'Brien, sure. who was uh, a phenomenal floor trader uh, back in the 70s and early 80s. I mean, really a force on the floor uh, in a variety of markets. We had become friends over, um, from years or prior because the, R.J. O. was the largest cattle uh, broker in the world. Mm-hmm. And they had a big ag business going way back. I mean, the, uh, John's father, you know, was chairman of the uh, CME, I believe, when they introduced the cattle contract in 1965. Right. So they had a big uh, um, tie to that. Anyway, I, w- I traded a lot of cattle spreads, and so I got to know their traders and so forth. And so we would talk on the phone occasionally. And and uh, I was talking to him one day in Colorado, and I said, you know, I'm I'm, I'm not happy. I'm going to go do something on my own. And he said, well, if you ever do that, I want you know, talk to me. Mm. So we talked and he said, uh, you know, later, I think it was a few months in, in early, I don't know what year we're in now, 90, early 94. Sure. And uh, we came to an understanding uh, after talking. He said, you know, we, we need to be in, we need to have some exposure to managed futures and you need some help getting started. So uh, we'll give you office space. We'll handle all the, the details and you come to Chicago and, and set up shop and you can do anything you want. You can trade any strategy. You can do whatever you want to do. Just, with, you know. Um, Dominion Capital was born in 1994, in, that, in May, I believe, of 94, uh, mm. originally as a partnership between myself and, uh, and the O'Brien family, okay. uh, which uh, lasted right up until um, they sold the company in 2007. Oh, wow. Okay. And then uh, I bought the rest of the company back, and at the moment, I own all the shares. But mm-hmm. it, was a, it was an amazing time period. We got uh, I started... I, brought, I dusted off all my research on the shorter stra- trading strategies, which I'd been working on at my years at AO, even though I couldn't implement any of them right. in an attempt. Because after looking at trend following and doing research on trend following and seeing some of the things that, that uh, shall I say, some of the, I don't want to call them deficiencies, but things that, 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 that are innate to trend following yep. uh, that possibly could be helped by other strategies. And, and the short term thing was very appealing to me. And later I began to realize why I gravitated toward that, but I didn't at the time. I just, okay. It just appealed to me. So I, I started to, to do research and, and everything. And Dominion started trading uh, short term in 1994. Um, I think at that time, yeah, you know, I, I know Monroe Trout was doing some short term trading and then he kind of morphed into a fund to fund. And that wasn't, that was just a small portion of ultimately what he was doing. And uh, I think maybe Toby. Yeah. Crables was there a year before that or whatever, but there weren't very many players. No, exactly. It, it was pretty new. It was yeah. pretty new. Yeah. So we started uh, trading in, in May of 94, and um, things went well. Mm-hmm. Um, they went to, uh, you know, it was a good time to trade. And I think, we, you know, we were up, uh, you know, the first five years of trading, we were up double digits five consecutive years with no rolling, losing 12 month time periods. So Fantastic. it went pretty well, and after you know the end of five years, you know we we were up to about four hundred million under management, and I think at the time, you know, arguably the largest short-term trader in the future space, um, yeah. by actually by a pretty good margin. There weren't very many people that were even there were only a handful of traders to begin with, but uh, it had been uh, it was quite a ride, sure, uh, to say the sure. least. Um, during that time period, and uh, you know, this is more just the historical bent, not all the what exactly we were doing and how we were doing it and why we were doing it. Sure, sure. But, uh, sure, sure. Um, Dominion has just continued on that. We're still doing, you know, the same types, uh, 
of short-term trading um, and a mm. few uh, shifts um, just to kind of finish the historical narrative. Uh, mm. In 19, after having that great five-year run, um, something changed. And um, what, what I didn't realize the impact of it at the time, it didn't take very long to figure it out, but uh, the euro conversion in 1999 Mm. took away a substantial number of our markets. And we were trading what we had at the time. It was called the Global Financial Program. Yeah. So there were no physical commodities whatsoever. I mean, that was kind of, uh, you know, I, I took them out of the portfolio um, at, at the beginning simply because, well, one, I, I wanted to target only uh, institutions. At the time, institutions didn't like physical commodities. Everything was pork bellies, so they only understood financials. <laughs> and two, nobody really thought that anybody could trade short term. Right. Uh, and they were all concerned about capacity. I mean, if you got to, you know, even 100 million, I mean, when we got to 100 million, the phone was ringing off the hook, people were scared to death that we were going to implode due to capacity constraints. Sure. Um, so I, I had a very simplistic allocation scheme. I, you know, a third went to equity indices, a third to fixed income, and a third to foreign exchange. And unfortunately, the euro conversion, I ended up losing a bunch of our fixed income markets mm. because they all converged to, you know, the, the euro bond. Yeah. And I lost a lot of FX markets. And so the portfolio morphed into not a third, a third, a third, but it morphed into about 76, 77% equity indices. Right. And the rest, uh, which at the time didn't bother me because we were like, you know, trading equity indices through the 90s was like owning a printing press. Uh, they were just great markets to trade, both sides uh, for us. Uh, but then when you had, we had the, the, the year 2000 kind yeah, of uh, implosion, yeah. you know, then those markets were no longer so interesting to trade. And yet we didn't have it. We only, you know, the rest of our portfolio was only like twenty percent. So I realized the portfolio was really out of whack. And eventually, you know, we didn't blow up or anything like that. We just simply sure. kind of flatlined. We had some flat years in there, and um, and that led to the evolution of what we trade now, which is the Sapphire program, which uh, is a more integrated, has an entirely different. I mean, it's for lack of a better term, it's more fully diversified. But I'm sure at some point we'll talk about. Yeah, we'll the definitely get into. Scheme. Yeah, absolutely, we'll definitely go into that. No, I was going to say, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's a fascinating story. I really, really appreciate you uh, uh, sharing all those details. I think there's so much to be, uh, to be learned from that. And I think it's so inspirational for many people who listen to it, you know, to, to hear your story. I want to, um, you're absolutely right, you know, we're definitely going to talk about Sapphire and all of that. But before we jump into to sort of the next part, I want to ask, ask a question which is um, a little bit off topic. But I think I'm, you know, I'm sure you're up for this, and that is the relationship between magic and financial markets, where you could say that reality and perception is reflected in in two different worlds, or perhaps not so different. I know you've spent some time thinking about these things, um, but probably not many people do. Can you share some of those? Uh, thoughts that you have about these two on the surface very different worlds but quite related yeah i got involved in in, in magic at a very young age but uh you know most of it was sleight of hand most of it was what we call close-up magic mm -hmm. uh, when i was uh in college i would uh, i was a bartender and i would do table hopping go table to table <laughs> do magic for tips and so forth and um when you uh learn how to do magic uh, well, you, you are forced to become, you know, to a, in a certain sense, a student of psychology. Mm. At the same time, I had been studying psychology in college, and it helped flesh out a lot of the concepts of why people are fooled. And, mm -hmm. and what is it about, you know, people think that the hand is quicker than the eye, and it really has nothing to do with speed. It has everything to do with perception, how people perceive things. And the biases they have in uh, in, in their perception, mm. and and many of the same you know concepts you could uh, you know talk about, um, and you could go through the different aspects of prospect theory and behavioral finance, and you can tie them out to magic if if you know if we had enough time. But the most important one, uh, which is the it's the way that our brain processes information, you know, the heuristic behind that. We you know we put together pieces of things when we don't have all the pieces so that our mind can function well. So you see things, you know, when you look at a door in a room from an, from an odd angle, it, mm. it, it doesn't look, it shouldn't look, you know, perfectly square, but your mind makes all these corrections because it knows what ought to be the way that it is and so forth. So your mind fills in. It's kind of like, you know, and now in science we have, you know, these incredible 
high resolution television screens and they sure. you know they fill in the pixels even if there's some damage to the to the to the CD or whatever mm. and it's it's you know our brain works in that same way so the way you fool the way I was able to fool people is that you use the way they interpret data against them so that they think something is happening or, or something is going down this path when it's really going down another path mm. and it's uh you know I guess for lack of a better term you could call it gestalt psychology which is that where you you have this uh um, heuristic and that helps you to process things but when I was in college because I was a, a, a magician I, and I befriended my psych professor mm. and I told him my, my thoughts about how some of the magic um, related you know to some of the material we were doing and he said why don't you come in and and, and uh, do a few things and we'll discuss it in class so I did that and then after that I became a you know a perennial lecture in all of his class and it kept building and building and building. Little did I know that later on in life, um, I would use even portions of some of those uh, demonstrations I gave at different conferences. Back in the 90s, uh, I used to do some magic at different conferences when I would have speaking, um, when I was asked to speak. Mm -hmm. And I, I toned it down. I stopped doing it only because as the business started to become a little bit more institutionalized, I, I felt like some people might think that I wasn't taking it seriously. Right. Because I was doing, you know, like a, a you know, maybe some type of a, a, a trick that was demonstrating a gambling, you know, a three card Monty or something, and, and maybe somebody might think that it's gambling, or they might think, you know, now you see it, now you don't, is their money disappearing, or <laughs> you know, something like that. So uh, I, I, I kind of put that on the back burner for a while. Um, but what it, what hit me early on in my trading was, and that really helped me link, I, you know, with all the pain and, and suffering, and you begin to see the importance of psychology. And you're trying to understand how your emotions are, are kind of at times working for you, at times working against you. Mm. But I realized that so much about how my emotions were functioning was a function of my perception. What you think, you know, what you, how you view the world, how you see things. Mm. And then I was able to make the connection with me you know, doing magic. Mm. And when I'm doing magic and somebody is in front of me, they see what I want them to see. And I lead them down a, a thought process that uh, hopefully will bury the real secret of what I'm trying to do. Um, mm. It's difficult to explain, but when you're, you use these psychological principles to to cancel out people's explanations right. um, by doing uh, variations of the same effect, and you do it different ways. So each time, and then you keep confirming the fact that you never touched something, even though you touched it or whatever. And, and they will they'll take a lie detector test and pass it <laughs> if you you know pr you go if you learn how to set the table correctly. But what, what what kind of popped out to me was that I was you know in being involved in the markets as if I was a spectator. As if I was the person, you know, on the other side of the table or on the other side of the stage, and I was being, uh, my perception was just being, uh, you know, like a cork on the ocean. I was letting all these things uh, affect me and not really, uh, um, I wasn't really a player. I was a spectator in, in what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And so as a, as a magician, then you begin to realize that, the, that you can, you know, what you do as a magician is you control the narrative. Mm -hmm. You control uh, what you want the reality to be seen and uh, later you know as I got more into trading and began to debate and understand what what is more important in the markets is it perception or reality mm. is that the people perceive that something is going to happen or perceive that interest rates are too high or lower they perceive that, that XYZ or if it actually is or isn't and at the end of the day you know you, you, you it's a very blurry line between uh, you know perception and reality I mean you could even argue in the markets reality doesn't matter Mm. Because eventually, when reality catches up, it will change perception. Mm. Sure. You know, I mean, everybody can ignore you know the financial crisis, but eventually, the crisis will cause things to implode, and then they will accept the crisis, and they will perceive it. You know, but they won't perceive it during the entire time period. Mm. But the difficulty when you just go on, you know, what you believe to be true is you can be, you know, you can be shorting the stock market all the way up in, you know, through the '90s or yeah. through any bull market run, and and not really understanding how why the market is not accepting. Mm. And that kind of perception and reality situation gets into, you know, the different concepts of, uh, you know, confirmation bias and different things in behavioral finance and why people uh, uh, process information that way. But I, I think I was able to kind of process that myself because of the magic, because of the way that I, I understood the psychology behind it. Mm. The categories of thought were never, okay, this is behavioral finance. I, I had no idea what that term was, but you begin to realize all the principles you're building together. You know, I wasn't I wasn't inventing you know the wheel. Other people had already worked on this stuff, and I wish I'd found the material earlier. But it came together. Yeah. So 
that's kind of the connection with sure, the sure. magic side. Yeah, no, it's quite interesting because obviously, uh, I guess nowadays a lot of people, uh, you know, are, are, are at least debating whether the the Fed and other central banks, uh, you know, are creating some kind of illusion for the world right now with all that magic money or whatever they are they are printing and 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 that creates obviously uh, some interesting situations but I, I i just find it fascinating the way you the way it's impacted you and and what you've used and how you've used it which we may learn a little bit more about as we dive into it so i want to um i want to talk i want to bring it up to date and just uh, talk a little bit about how you've set yourself up today um and uh, sort of the the infrastructure that uh, that you run what you found uh, efficient uh, for operating in the short term space but of course, I have to touch also on on the fact that you've uh, certainly not chosen one of the financial hubs to uh, to locate your business. <laughs> Tra- Traverse City uh, doesn't strike me as being uh, sort of the biggest financial center. But uh, so, h- how does that impact your uh, you know your your business life? Well, I'll tackle that question first, and then we'll go back. Traverse City, uh, it, it it was not initially. Um, any part of my plan. <laughs> in the 90s, uh, I was in Chicago, living in Chicago, working. Uh, our office was down the loop and right in the middle of everything, uh, right. which was great. Really enjoyed it. Uh, it was wonderful. And then a couple things happened. In 1999, I was, like I said, I was operating out of the R.J. O'Brien building and the building was sold and they were moving uh, their whole offices to a new office building. And at the same time, I was a little paranoid about the uh, Y2K situation. Mm-hmm. And uh, if it was going to have an impact on the business, I mean, for a good year and a half prior to that, a day didn't go by in the office where we didn't have to fill out due diligence forms about being compliant, Y2K compliant on this. Right. And that, and yeah. It was just, it was always on everybody's mind. And was it going to cause, you know, it was going to impact the stock market. It was going to impact this, that, or the other thing. And um, so I was also at the time learning a handful of things about, you know, life in general that I hadn't learned before. Like, it's great to make money. But then Uncle Sam takes half of it. Hmm. So I, I was looking into moving the company uh, to Bermuda. I'd been talking to uh, a lot of the guys and, and many of the families that were working for Monroe Trout over there. Sure. And I was considering some options. And I had some ideas on some reinsurance products, which were big at the time, way back in the 90s. And but I, I thought, well, I'm, I'm not going to move out to an island 600 miles off the coast of the Carolinas right before the lights are going to go out. Right. So I thought... Smart thing to do is I'll sell my house in Chicago and move up to my. I had, I had when I moved to Chicago, um, I bought a, vac- a vacation home up in near Traverse City, just north of Traverse City, a little town called Northport, mm-hmm. which is a town of 400 people. But it, it, amazingly enough, it's gotten a lot of press the last few years because some of the um, shown up in different magazines because of some people that live up there. But mm-hmm. anyway, the uh, so I thought this is. A no-brainer. I'll sell my house in Chicago. That way, if there's some kind of financial crash or something, I'm not going to be stuck with uh, this house. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I'll move up. And so I moved up uh, out of the city with the intent of then moving to Bermuda once the coast was clear. Sure. Well, I just uh, I, by by this time, this is like you know 1999, and in 1999, my fifth child was born. Right. And I was getting a lot of static from our staff at that point. I think we had maybe. I don't know. We had, we had a lot. We had a lot of traders to to operate short term when you're still using. You know, when you don't have electronic interfaces. Sure. Everybody's got to be on the phone and and the back office paperwork that we generated because nothing was you know nothing was straight through processing. It no. was a nightmare. Sure. We had uh, just crazy. We had to you know the, our back office was so backed up every night because of all of our trading that, that we had we had to fax all these physical statements out and fax mm. trade confirms and everything and. We had a it was about I remember this vividly. I don't know why, but we had like a six thousand dollar a month fax bill, <laughs> and this was like after mm. negotiating a super duper cheap, like the cheapest rate that everybody would be shocked at. I mean, we had sure. to send out we had you know people at fax stations to like seven o'clock at night just shooting pages through at a time. It was uh, I tell you the business is so much easier operationally than it was uh, back in the day. Yeah, but I came up to 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 Northport with the intention of just being here. I I always had had a satellite office up here all through the nineties. Sure to work at and, and the kids would come up and we'd, my wife would stay there and I'd just commute back and forth to Chicago and whenever I had to travel around the world for whatever to meet clients, uh, that's what I do. Mm. So I moved up here and then, you know, the lights didn't go out and then um, I was getting some static and then right around the same time, um, I think it was, uh, I think it was Clinton was pushing hard to, to close some of the loopholes um, on 
being able to leave the U.S. Right. made it a lot more difficult in terms of how many you know, the benefits to uh, working outside the country and, and, and X Y Z. Between that and the static I was getting and, and uh, from my family and mm. uh, from my employees who weren't so anxious to move as I was. You know, I, I'm from the East Coast. My wife and I are both from New Jersey, and uh, you know, I grew up with a summer home right on, on the ocean, so I love water. I mean, yeah. I just, being on an island just doesn't make me. Uh, I don't get island fever. I love. Sure. I, I, I love it. <laughs> so we just we ended up just staying, and uh, it, I uh, you know to this day we don't have a single client in the state of Michigan, uh, but Traverse City is a it's it's a you know for people who are not from anywhere in the Midwest, um, even you know they wouldn't realize it. it's kind of the uh, vacation destination and a place where people in you know. Uh, Cincinnati, uh, Chicago, Detroit, you know, a lot of the mi Midwest cities all had their summer homes for the last, you know, 150 years. Mm. It was, you know, it was like, you know, in the East Coast going to upstate New York or something, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, back before there was air conditioning, right? <laughs> and, you know, the, there's, uh, you know, 27 wineries up here and there are, uh, you know, four microbreweries and there are downhill skiing and the sailing and boating is great and the snowmobiling is nice and, <laughs> Uh, you know, and there's, believe it or not, there's these beautiful big sand dunes and sand beaches, yeah. uh, which you no, know, I never would have dreamt of uh, coming from the East Coast. So I just ended up staying, and yeah. I, I, I'm I'm here because I want to be here. I mean, yeah. we've at times talked about going uh, back into the city. I mean, I worked in Pittsburgh, I worked in Denver, I worked in Chicago. When we first moved up here, and up until the crisis, it wasn't very difficult to get traffic through here. I mean, it wasn't like it was in Chicago, where you just got right. a lot of people sure. that were, you know, incidental. Hey, I happen to be there. I got an hour to kill. I need to do another meeting. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll see you. And that was nice. Yeah. Uh, I never, I never made it home for dinner because of that, but sure. it, it was, it was nice for the business. Uh, and then when the first couple of years up here, we had people from you know just about every country that we've ever done business from, from Japan, from you know Australia, all over Europe, Canada, you know, you name it. Uh, and then that started to slow down a little bit. Um, and then post crisis, it's been a lot more difficult to get traffic up sure, here. Well, sure. And I think that's part of it is because, you know, the business is, you know, is overall managed futures is just not doing well, and so there's not a lot of product development and not a lot of stuff happening. Sure. And when that's not happening, nobody wants to make that extra leg. I mean, our clients come up here obviously, and mm. people do due diligence, but we just don't get the incidental traffic, which, to a small extent, yes, I think in, in recently is. Uh, makes it a little bit more difficult. Now that you've described the beauty of it, you might actually see some more people coming. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. It would be uh, it would be nice. And how uh, how you structured the, uh, the 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 business side, uh, you know, with all the technology we have today compared to where where we were uh, 10 years ago as you explained. I mean, what does it take nowadays to to run a a short-term uh, trading operation? What we do, um, our needs are are Should I say a bit different than your average CTA? Okay. And and maybe explaining that a little bit will help uh, understand the nature of uh, of our business because generally speaking, businesses are built around whatever their core uh, you know product is. And, and as a CTA, your product is your is your trading and your profits. Mm. And so everything is kind of built around that, and anything, everything supports that, and so forth. So most. CTAs and particularly short-term CTAs tend to build their business around their research, which is highly quantitative. Mm. So, uh, you know, the the staffing and the uh, the math guys and the rocket scientists and all that uh, is a huge part of what they do. It's not a huge part of what we do, mm. um, and at times it's difficult to explain this to people because they just expect if you're a short-term trader that you're uh, you know you're, you've got a staff of Russian scientists and. Uh, mathematicians uh, crunching numbers around the clock, and you're you know laying fiber optic cable to the exchange for <laughs> you know latency reasons and all this kind of stuff, and sure. and they look at our firm, and we've never you know other than a friend of mine that I hired for a few years as a program, we've never had anybody who's had any kind of science, math, or or, or computer degree mm. uh, all the way through. As a matter of fact, even our staffing now, we have more people that have uh, degrees in psychology, uh, philosophy. Uh, religion, communications, things that, that you would not normally associate with uh, trading in general, but more specifically short term, sure. you know, systematic trading. Yeah. And this, the reason, you know, for that, if I, you know, may digress for just a minute, because Absolutely. it's always a, a, a source of contention when people, you know, are, they look at it and like, well, you obviously don't have the uh, research necessary to compete in the world. And so, well, you know, 
we're in business for 20 years. I think we've you know at least been able to stay in business, which I guess is a good thing. And we've had sure. our moments and of ups and downs. But the real issue is, uh, you know, why do we do things the way we do them? Yeah. Why is it that we don't go down this road and we don't uh, we don't tackle these problems the, the same way everybody else does? Yeah. And the you know the the short and sweet answer to that is because of my background. Yeah. Um, I, I approach the whole trading situation from you know. Uh, a real blend of philosophy and psychology. And we've talked a little bit about the, the mm-hmm. psych stuff, but not, not a lot. But the philosophy really, to me, was um, a bigger element, a bigger uh, issue in terms of pushing me in a certain direction on how my trading was going to look and what, what I needed to do to support the, a particular style of trading. Mm-hmm. And that, that, you know, that goes back to, you know, it's, it's a gradual process that's happening those early years that I was talking about trading for myself and trading for the small trading group that I put together and then my experiences, my three years as uh, you know, senior trader at AO Management. And you, know, you, you go through this whole process and as you were, as the whole time I'm looking at, you know, what is my strategy? What is, how do I want to approach the markets? What is my strength and what do I want to do? And I kept having a problem reconciling all the different strategies that I was reading about. Mm-hmm. I mean, just, there was a certain philosophical hiccup in my brain that I couldn't got, get, get my arms around. And, and what it was, was the fact that, um, you know, my background in philosophy is um, more geared toward ancient philosophy. Uh, you know, my father had me he turned on to Aristotle and Plato and, and the pre-Socratics at an early age. And, and uh, he was my professor for a lot of my classes in mm-hmm. college. Mm-hmm. So I, I, you know, I was, um, you know, either well educated or brainwashed. I'm not sure <laughs> which perspective I want to take, but I, I had a real a passion for um, the classics and, and, and Aristotelian logic in particular. Okay. So uh, um, when I'm looking at the the markets and I'm thinking, okay, how do I want to trade? I'm thinking, do I want to be, you know, and it didn't. It seemed to me it didn't really matter what I picked because if I was going to trade the markets on a fundamental basis, I'm basically saying that I'm looking back in the past and I'm, I'm looking at certain fundamentals that would make something cheap or expensive or that's what everybody says that the stocks to use ratio the price ought to be x or when this happens or you know whatever and if you're in the stock market you know pe ratio or whatever um you're looking at all these different events in the past and you're saying this will tell me in the future what value is and 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 what it ought to be mm-hmm. and if i'm a technical trader i'm going to look at the past and say here's a head and shoulders pattern and you know most of the time that that happens in the past you know, I've counted 75 times it's happened out of, you know, X, Y, Z. It, it seems to point in the future that this is going to happen. Or if sure. I'm going to look, you know, pick a strategy, any strategy. At the end of the day, I ran into a real difficulty with trying to understand just because it's happened in the past, why does that mean it's going to happen in the future? Right. And for, for my field of study, which is epistemology, which is the theory of knowledge, how do you know you know? Mm. How can you va- validate or verify anything that you know and what gives you any confidence that, in what you believe is true? It's a universal and, truth, I guess. <laughs> exactly. And that's what, you know, that's what Aristotle basically said. And through his, you know, he basically, you know, uh, invented uh, the logic as, uh, that, was, that everybody kind of accepted for 2,000 years. Everybody's been debating over the last 100, you know, 100 as to whether or not it was right or not. But uh, he said in classical logic and you know, syllogistic logic that, uh, you know, there are, when we put these propositions together, you know, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal, we can evaluate their truth by looking at what he called the square of opposition, mm-hmm. which is if you could picture, you know, just if you drew a square on a piece of paper in the upper left-hand corner, uh, that stood for, uh, he had letters symbolizing them, and, but it, that stood for the universal affirmative, mm-hmm. which, for example, I could say all toll bridges are expensive. Right. So, and... So the upper right-hand corner is the universal negative. All toll bridges are not expensive. Down mm-hmm. in your lower left-hand corner is the particular affirmative. At least one toll bridge is expensive. And the lower right-hand corner is the particular negative. At least one toll bridge is not expensive. Mm-hmm. And Aristotle went on to try to argue, we have inferences that are true always by looking at the relationships between these four propositions. Right. You know, For example, the top two, the universal affirmative and the universal negative, they're, they're called contraries. Uh, they both can be false, but they both can't be true. Mm. The relationship between the particular affirmative and the particular, the particular negative is a subcontrary, and it's the exact opposite. Both can be uh, true, but both cannot be false. Mm-hmm. And the relationship between the universal affirmative and the particular negative is, you know, called a contradictory, and they both 
cannot be true and they both cannot be false. Mm -hmm. One has to be one, one has to be the other. But the relationship that, that had the most important bearing on my understanding of trading was the subaltern relationship, which is the relationship between the universal affirmative and the universal negative. Mm -hmm. If all toll bridges are expensive, then the universal, the particular affirmative, at least one toll bridge is expensive, yeah. has to be true. Yeah. But the reverse is not true. I mean, if you say at least one toll bridge is expensive, there's no way that that implies that all toll bridges are expensive. Exactly. However, the opposite is true, the, uh, the reversal of that. If you say at least one toll bridge is not true, you have proven false the universal affirmative that all toll bridges are true, mm. which is, you know, falls into a different line of thinking called falsification, and, and Popper gets into that. And, and, uh, but I was more intrigued by the universal because Aristotle was very consumed by universals, the things that were always true, and you know, getting into natural law and so forth. And so I thought to myself, you know, if I'm looking at a, you know, a toll bridge, toll bridge, toll bridge, toll bridge, therefore all toll bridges, how is that any different than looking at head and shoulders, head and shoulders, head and shoulders, and drawing some conclusion that really didn't seem to, to logically uh, come about? You know, it's kind of like saying, uh, hey, white swan, white swan, white swan, white swan, therefore all swans are white. Right. Well, uh, it, it, <laughs> logically, it's 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 and, and basically the subaltern arrangement here, uh, this understanding of Aristotelian logic, is really at the basis of so many, shall we say, financial implosions, that conclusions and 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 ideas that are treated as universals because of the of witnessing the particulars rather than the other way around. So mm. I thought to myself, I, I'm looking at particulars when I should be looking at universals. So what are you, what are the universals? Right that I can trade from. What is something that will be true tomorrow, true the next day, true the next day, true, true until forever. Right. And, and if it's true forever, then it can't be empirically validated. So mm -hmm. it has to be accepted as true. Right. And, and so like a natural law, it's just understood. You know, it's like one plus one is two. Well, I can do one plus one a million times and get two, but the only way that I can say that it's a universal is to say that I accept it, that it will always be that way because it is. It can never be empirically validated. Sure. Uh, and so I find myself as a, a, you know, a, an Aristotelian approaching the markets from what I would call a deductive point of view rather than inductive. So we start with universals and we reason, you know, everything that we do, we basically believe, you know, you could do it if you were locked in a closet most of your life because it's just, it's necessarily true. Right. It is not something based upon data. Um, and this is, you know, not to get off topic, but my, uh, we talk about Dominion being a firm that um, looks at the world through Austrian economic eyes, not because we make economic pronouncements, but the, the methodology of Austrian economists, the process is, that's their epistemology. They, it's very deductive. It's not empirical. It's mm -hmm. not because we found 47 people that have benefited from the minimum wage, therefore it must work. It's mm -hmm. like, well, it's not about working. It's what you know these the principle or the universal uh, is true and, mm -hmm. and must be true even if you don't see it to be true so I thought I kept thinking to myself what, what can I focus on here that will help me and there were a couple things that I discovered but as it pertains to what we do in Dominion from day one till now is the psychology the psychology of the markets is is my universal affirmative in okay. other words how people make decisions isn't going to change tomorrow the next day, the next day, and just like the, you know, it's not because of the studies that, uh, you know, Tversky and Kahneman did to, to, and how they basically created portfolio theory as a, as a science. This existed well before they, it was something that was discovered, not something mm -hmm. that anybody created. This is, uh, this is the way people process information, and they will always process it that way. And if that is true, which I believe very much to be true, and, you know, we could get a lot deeper into philosophy and religion and, and all that to, to, to debate that issue, but if you'll grant me that, mm. which uh, that's our starting point. That, that, and so when we build a trading model, we build everything you know, from that top down. We don't look at data and say, well, what works and what, what can we do and how do we, make, you know, how do we create a short-term trading system? We look at it and say, how do people make decisions and how are they trapped in these bad decisions and how can we capture that? And it's very, very specifically in the marketplace. So, you know, Right now, as we're speaking, there are no computers running simulations in our office. Mm. It's not that we don't run simulations. It's just that we do zero data mining. We mm. don't just keep trying variations of things. Yeah. We have very, very specific things we're looking to capture in the marketplace. And most of the great ideas, once you picture them in your head, once they become obvious to you, uh, you don't even have to backtest them. I and mean, we certainly do. We do yeah. a, a ton of work. But 
uh, it's that type of approach. So we really, um, to make a long story short, uh, we simply don't really have need of, of you know, like uh, 100 you know, PhDs or <laughs> even five that are, that are going to just start sifting through data. Um, and we have enough. Uh, our, our, our research is based upon a feedback loop of once you understand the ideas, hmm. seeing how the market feeds back that information of, of that decision making. And so, you know, our traders are involved in the research process and a few other people are involved in it, but not no, no quants. Sure. Um, we can always farm out the quantitative stuff if it's something that I can't handle. I'm a pretty proficient programmer and I, you know, I, uh, I think I managed to get through calculus in college, but uh, mm -hmm. I, uh, the bigger issue is not because we, we really, we're really looking for things that we can tie out. Now, so that kind of is a long way of answering the question of how do we staff our company and, and why do we why do we do things the way that we do? So. But 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 no, but the, but that was a very important explanation, and it it, it ties into so many other things. And and I want to go I, I want to go further than this, but I, I want to actually ask you question that actually doesn't relate to short-term trading sure but but it's my kind of trying to understand what it is you're saying and putting into a, a slightly different perspective and that's relates to more generally speaking about trend following because obviously as we know you mentioned 1994 and i remember seeing you know all the all the great guys sitting lined up at, at a conference in chicago and and talking you know about a very difficult period but they were convinced that this was just you know a difficult period and things would come back but 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 let me ask you this trends in markets in general not necessarily short term but just generally is that kind of based on universal truth because at the end of the day trends reflect human behavior and human behavior will never change and what we're seeing now then where perhaps there have been a lack of trends for a period of time is just part of you know, a normal cycle. Absolutely. I, uh, I often express <clears throat> my, um, I don't say unhappiness, but I, I think trend followers could do a much better job of, of explaining what they're doing. You know, everybody seems to want to be a scientist. <laughs> 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 Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.